speaker today is uh, Professor Sumbara Kamapati. Some of you may have been here in August 2019, where again he spoke at that time. We didn't have chat GPT as yet, but he did speak about uh, artificial intelligence. And on that day, again it rained and we had to shift here. But I think we shifted after everybody assembled, so it was a packed uh, uh, audience. Uh, anyway, I'm sure this talk, uh, incidentally we put it on YouTube after a couple of weeks and then it uh, reaches a much larger via audience. Um, Professor Subarao uh, is going to speak on um, generative uh, AI revolution, uh, what happens to our reality uh, in the light of uh, these revolutions that are actually taking place. Uh, as he was saying, just last week we had uh, Chat GPT 4, and he was wondering if by the time this talk is given, it will become Chat GPT 5. Uh, it's also a, a subject where world over, we are trying to understand, we are trying to uh, grapple with what it means, and he's probably the best person to speak on this, having worked on this for many years and probably uh, decades. Uh, for those of you, um, if I can just. Um, he is um, a graduate of uh, IIT Madras in the early 80s, then University of Maryland where he got his PhD. And he's been a professor at the Arizona State University. And he's held many uh, positions. He's a professor of computer science. He's a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence uh, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He served as the president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence and he's a number of, um, he's a founding board member of the Partnership on AI. So as you can see, he is very experienced in this field. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have a, a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. So as, uh, as usual, can we start with the uh, national uh, anthem? And this time... Uh, yeah, me, I hope. Uh, this is okay? Uh, okay. So I am going to talk about this generative AI revolution and what happens to our reality uh, when AI can spin many synthetic realities. And it all sort of becomes clearer as we go on. I realize that they sort of, some people are actually from computing industry. I'm like the more like a software engineering side sort of people. Uh, but I really wanted to reach people who are not actually you know, doing uh, deep learning research. I want to, because this is something that is uh, of uh, significant interest to the society right now, uh, because we are going to be ready for a disruption, essentially. So I am actually trying to, I made this talk so that it will reach to people that are not necessarily experts in AI. So um, I'll, uh, and I th in case you are not one of, uh, you are one of those people, it's actually for you. That's what I'm making it for. Okay. So, uh, let's see. So I should say something about uh, my employer, um, Arizona State University School of Computing and uh, Augmented Intelligence. And um, um, that's the um, URL. Um, and then, you know, it's a, it's a very large uh, department um, with a you know, significant amount of research in all sorts of areas, including AI. Uh, I should mention that uh, and in some circles, Arizona State University, ASU, is also called Andhra State University uh, because we have quite a significant number of master's students um, in Arizona State University. Um, about myself, you know, uh, Ramon Rao said some things already, uh, but essentially this is not about my group's research. It's a lot more about what's going on in AI right now. But I wanted to mention a little about my group's research um, I work in human aware AI systems and explainable AI and planning and decision making. Uh, I want uh, AI systems to be, I want AI systems to be able to work with humans. That becomes very important. Um, you know, in one of the big issues that has become critical in AI is that the systems 
make decisions that are inscrutable. They just make a decision and you take it or leave it. And in general, in human societies, when you make a decision, you are supposed to justify why you made a decision. Um, and so the question is, how do you get systems to work with us? And for them to work with us, they need to be able to explain their decisions. They need to be able to you know, um, um, provide a rationale for them, or they need to do things that we expect them to do. So that's the kind of research that I work on. and. Uh, you know, that involves human-robot interaction as well as human-cyber AI system interaction. That's a pretty big topic, but I'm not going into that in today's talk. Um, I also, on the side, do public outreach uh, about the social and technical impacts of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, and then, so basically, I write a bunch of articles. Uh, actually, there's a series of articles that I wrote for uh, this um, uh, thing called The Hill in uh, United States, uh, which basically looks at uh, introduction, introducing you know, the, the leaps and bounds in AI. Um, for over the last two, three years, I've written these uh, columns, what just happened, uh, about deep fakes, um, why are AI systems biased, uh, will AI systems get along with us or kill all of us? Um, and then, actually, in Ramon Ragaru's um, um, uh, uh, India Forum, I wrote this broad and shallow AI, which is actually quite relevant to today's talk. Uh, I'll mention actually what I mean by broad and shallow AI. And then, most recently, I wrote uh, this um, um, Hill column on beauty, lies, and chat GPT, welcome to the post truth world. You can think of what I'm doing today is the talk version of that, that column, but in a longer talk version of that column. Okay, um, as Ramon Rao said, I was here. <laughs> I was here in uh, 2019, and I, I think I believe again inside, and that's what he was saying, and, um, and I enjoyed uh, that experience, so I decided uh, to come back uh, when you know, Ramon Rao has been asking me you know, to come, and whenever I come back, and so I try to make time for this. Um, but I wanted to kind of connect what I said last time, some of you, I don't know, are there anybody here who are in the 2019 lecture? Okay, okay, so for you, I'm going to just make a little connection to that lecture, to this lecture. Um, so last time when I was in Manthan in the summer of 2019, I was telling you about the way AI progressed versus how human kids learn about, um, learn about um, you know, um, the world around them and how they sort of show intelligent behavior. Interestingly, human kids start by showing perceptual uh, intelligence, then emotional intelligence, then social and communicative intelligence, and only then start taking all these crazy exams uh, like JEs, SATs, etc. What you call cognitive intelligence, and and maybe even play chess game or something. Um, that's how kids do, you know. So you never see a two-year-old playing chess, okay? But a two-year-old can recognize her mom's face can recognize whether or not her dad is angry at her, can, recognize, can actually know how to manipulate her grandmother to give her more cookies. These are all things, the emotional, social intelligence stuff that you know, kids do. And the, interestingly, um, what happened is AI, on the other hand, went almost in the opposite direction. Um, actually, much before the current AI systems, we were able to get things like expert systems, um, which sort of did rule-based reasoning, and then also chess systems like the Deep Blue and so on. Um, and so in a way, AI systems went backwards. So they did cognitive tasks first, and they came to perceptual tasks later. And to some extent, language, which is like a big part of today's talk, is kind of perception. We do it, but we don't know how we do it. And in fact, I mentioned in that talk, and I'll say it again here, that a big difference in these tasks is cognitive and reasoning tasks. Not only do we do it, but we can explain how we do it. Okay, so there are steps that we follow to get to the uh, final answer. Whereas the top ones, you do it, but you don't know how you do it. Okay, you know how to recognize your mother's face. Can you write me an essay? That's so that I can follow that essay to recognize your mother's face. No way. This is exactly the random thing that happens when people try to def you know, define, describe people. They make random you know, English text, which are part of our Telugu text. That is not at all giving you the real picture of the person. Okay. Similarly, swimming. Can you tell me how I can swim by writing essays about it? You know, I'll sink like a stone if, if I try to swim that way. There are things that we do 
but we don't know how we do them. And those are called the tacit knowledge tasks. And there are things that we do that, and we know how we do them. Those are called explicit knowledge tasks. Civilization, to a large extent, is about explicit knowledge tasks. You know, a judge doesn't get to say, yeah, I feel like sending you to the jail. You look kind of, you know, criminal to me. And you don't get to say that, you know. They have to give this huge, big, um, you know, essay as to why they think, in fact, they are supposed to reach this particular decision. So they're not only reaching a decision, they're providing a rationale as to how they reach that decision. So that falls in the cognitive side. Chess, for example, we know the rules and so on. And so one of the big things that I made pointed last time was um, that the AI revolution, um, you know, recently has finally caught up with the tacit knowledge tasks. We were able to do explicit knowledge tasks before, but now we can also do tacit knowledge tasks. And a lot of human intelligence pre-civilization as it were, the one that we shared with the dogs, the cats, the snakes, etc. That's tacit knowledge task. Unfortunately, if you don't have that, you can't do the rest of it. Okay? Um, and, and so, in fact, AI research has come, um, started looking at that. And in fact, one of the big differences that, you know, it's like a capsule summary of what I said last time, um, is if you know how to do a task, you can write a program how to do that. And then the computer can follow it. If you try to tell the computer how to see a cat, it fails miserably because you don't know how to see a cat. You just know when you see a cat, but you don't know how to explain to anybody why you think it is a cat, why you think it's a dog, why you think it's a, your father or whatever. Okay? So for the tacit knowledge tasks, there is no way of programming the computers. You have to make them learn from examples, the way we seem to have done, we seem to have done. So either examples are doing action in the world. And much of the AI revolution, revolution has been sort of based on learning from these examples, the ones in the tacit knowledge task. I also mentioned that civilization essentially involved us having explicit knowledge tasks on top of this tacit knowledge. Right? We don't get to say, I don't want to talk about it, I'll just do it this way. That's not going to be enough. Okay, so that was a short uh, uh, summary of that. Um, so is, is the audio okay? Or do you want me to... Okay. Um, so the, the two things that actually kind of happened quite much a lot in, in the in AI's area um, in the last four years. So I'm kind of back to give you the report on what's going on in AI, you know, from 2019 to now. Uh, two things is one is we went from deep and narrow AI systems to broad and shallow ones. Okay, deep and narrow is it's a system that works in one area. It has very good understanding of that particular task. Like, for example, AlphaGo, uh, Deep Blue. These understand, quote unquote, the game, the rules, the search, and everything. They're, but they're only good for that and nothing else. So you could make fun of them by saying, yeah, you can defeat me in chess. But you know, the, the joke is that a, an AI system is one which is trying to make the perfect go move or perfect chess move when the room is on fire. As you know, when the room is on fire, you say, to heck with the chess, let me get out running and screaming. Okay? So it doesn't have the intelligence outside of its narrow area, but for its narrow area, it's the master of the domain. Those are the kinds of systems we worked on before. More and more recently, we've been looking at broad and shallow systems, systems that sort of have competence, quote-unquote competence in large number of areas, but they're not particularly good at any one of them. There's no guarantees that the answers that they're giving to you in those areas are correct. Whereas the narrow ones basically tend to have a much deeper system. Of course, you, what you really want in the end is broad and deep. That hasn't yet happened. So we've just started working, what? Sure, please take, yeah. Um, what basically um, we do want uh, broad and deep, but currently what we have is the deep and narrow, which used to be much more of the uh, work that was going on about a couple of three years back. And now all the craze is about these broad and shallow systems. Okay, that's one thing that you want to think about. The second one is in terms of learning, in terms of learning from examples, we went from discriminative classification, saying, is this a dog? Say yes or no. Is this a cat? 
say yes or no. Is this x-ray showing malignant tumor? Say yes or no. Two, show me a cat. Show me a dog. Write me a spam mail. Write me an essay of, on cow, you know, which I somehow think that Indian students always have to write an essay on cow. Um, and then uh, draw me a picture. So basically generate rather than just discriminate between examples. Okay. One of the interesting things is that, I, mean, I actually put that there, that it's like armchair you know, cricket players can be watching um, cricket and say, oh, that particular shot is no good, you know, I mean, it should have been done better way, versus Sunil Gavaskar saying the same thing. The difference is the bozos who have never played cricket, they just have bookish knowledge. They're essentially just trying to say yes or no without actually have, having the ability to do that shot themselves. Whereas if Gavaskar says it, he actually can generate that shot if you want. You understand what I'm saying? So my guess, my uh, usual example is, would you like your English essay to be graded by a teacher who can write essays himself or be graded by somebody who doesn't know how to write essays themselves, but they can tell whether it's a good essay or bad essay? Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so discriminative to generative is the ch uh, shift that we have made. So deep or narrow to broad and shallow and discriminative to generative. This is the big shift. Now going from there, the generative revolution, basically the generative models, which actually are in fact broad and shallow. This is something that you want to say. That's like the title slide of today's talk. Most of the work right now is generative and broad and shallow. There are no guarantees about anything that they do, whereas narrow and deep systems, actually, there may be guarantees. So many of you, um, some of you may have heard of DALI, stable diffusion, etc., cetera, um, which generate images, inst images of dogs, rather than just say, is it a dog or is it a cat? So I'm asking you the following question. I'm not following. I'm just saying two things. A woman working on a computer, Jamini Rai style. Some of you have already kind of imagined a picture. I'm pretty sure. I mean, some of you are bozos who have never heard of Jamini Roy. You know, God help you. But those of you <laughs> who have heard of Jamini Roy, you already imagined um, uh, like a picture in your head. You just don't know how to draw it. Most of us who can imagine, we are always imagining movies. We are imagining pictures in our heads. If only there was a USB connection to a printer, we would all be just as good a painter and a drawer as Claude Monet. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so a woman working on a computer, Germany Rai style. You can think about it. There was no computers until very recently which can actually think up a picture. Okay? Or a woman working on a computer, RK Lakshman style. I hope more people know how that looks like. And it would be like a drawing and you know it's like a different, very different kind of system. Again, you are able to imagine. The question is, right now we have these generative AI systems like DALI, Stable Diffusion, where they can actually imagine and write, draw the picture for you. So let me show you a few examples, especially for those of you who have not seen this. This was a set of tweets. By the way, I am like active on Twitter and I mostly talk about AI and also food and also Pedapurum, but um, also AI. Um, so this is a set of things that I showed um, last year, I think, July 2022. Um, so that is a woman working on a computer, Jamini Rai style. Those of you who know Jamini Rai think it sort of looks like Jamini Rai. At the time of Jamini Rai, there were no computers and there are no women working on computers pictures. So he did not draw it, you know, essentially Dali drew it for me. Okay. And this is a woman working on computer, um, R.K. Lakshman style. Once again, very reasonable. So you would say that may not be the exact picture you thought of, but it looks very reasonable. Um, a woman working on a computer, Amrita Shergill style oil painting. Since a lot of people didn't look like they understood Jamini Rai, let me give you some art education on the side. This is uh, Amrita Shergill style oil painting. Okay. Those of you who know Amrita Shergill, you would say, yeah, that sort of looks like her style. Okay. Um, woman working on a computer, Ravi Varma style. Woman working, a Kalahari woman working on a computer, Jamini Rai style. Okay, interesting. Notice that it's now able to give an African motif. This is a clearly an African 
woman with an African milieu in the background, but the angles, etc., are Jamini Roy. You see what I'm saying? Um, and then, of course, the woman working on a computer, Rabindranath Tagore style. Uh, and then this is on MF Hussain style. These are generative systems that generate images. Okay? That's one type of systems that people are very interested in. Right now, DALI was one of the first systems, but stable diffusion um, and uh, mid-journey have become public domain, almost like Linux style things, and anybody can work with them. So with these, uh, while I showed nice and uh, uh, reasonable you know, things right, about art, you can say, um, show me a picture of uh, Amitabh Bachchan slapping Dharmendra. I will show you a picture. I'm sure for that particular thing, I guess there are too many movies from which you can get that picture, but it could imagine that for you. You could even have Amitabh Bachchan slapping Hrithvik Roshan, even though they never probably, you know, were not contemporaries, or at least when the question is there, I think Amitabh Bachchan is too old to slap anybody. But um, they can imagine. Now, the interesting question is that nobody told it. This is not retrieving a picture. It trained itself by looking at the world of images on the web, along with the text uh, descriptions of those images. And when you give the text, it was able to actually put together this image. It's amazing, okay? It's amazing in one way and not amazing in another way because you have always done it yourselves. When I said all these things, if you knew these artists, you could have kind of, you know, imagined them. You just didn't know how to draw it. Now the machine can draw it for you. That's the big difference that happened, okay? Um, that's as interesting as it is, actually, the thing that people got really, really crazy about is generating language, not just pictures, but language. If you look at the language, which is ChatGPT, GPT-4, etc., and I'm sure lots of you are actually here <laughs> to hear about that. Um, so this is the abstract that I gave Ram Mohan Rao when he asked me, give me an abstract for your talk. Okay, so I gave my title and I wrote an abstract. This I wrote, okay? I mean, you can trust me, I wrote this. Then I thought, what a sucker am I? Am I supposed to be writing abstracts for a living now? Why not ask ChatGPT? So I asked ChatGPT, I have a to give a public lecture at Manthan Hyderabad is the title Generative AI Revolution. What happens to your reality? Blah, blah, blah. Can you please generate a 120 word abstract for my talk so I can send it to him? Thank you. So there is its abstract. You can read that. It's a pretty good abstract. It's not the one I wrote. It's generic enough. It actually connects to the points of the title. So I don't need to write abstracts. In fact, I would argue that you don't need to write any write only text, you know, like the vision of India that anybody can write. You know, you can actually write chat GPT, say, give me a vision for India. It'll write a nice vision. And if you say, I don't like this vision, generate it again, it'll give you another vision. Okay? So in fact, you don't need to spend time writing anymore. You know, this thing is actually able to write it for you. The sad part is that from an AI perspective and from a human perspective, language is something that we take as if it's quintessentially human. Not all of us know how to paint. You know, Jamini Rai knew how to paint. Maybe Jamini Rai would have been taken aback with those previous pictures because he said, my God, I spent my entire life, you know, trying to know how to <laughs> draw painting and this, now these bozos can just say, give me the paint and painting and he'll give it. But you and I, all of us write. We, we, we breathe language. We are always writing. We are always thinking in language. We think somehow that is like very quintessentially human and I can write better than you. I can write more beautifully than you. Well, come to the world, the new world where ChatGPT can write more beautifully than any of you, or at least as beautifully as you are at writing. Okay? And so I <laughs> said, first it came for chess folk. I mean, as an AI guy, I didn't panic because I ain't a chess dweeb. I don't need to worry, okay? And then it came for go folk. I didn't panic because I didn't go dweeb. Then it came for graphic artists. I didn't panic because I'm not an artsy dweeb. Now it's coming for essay writers. Oh no, what's our plan right now? <laughs> because everybody writes. And if you don't have to write, if people, if these machines are writing, what are we doing? Exactly, you know, how, what is the, our contribution to the civilization? This became a pretty big existential question.
okay um, now you can say well yeah come on anybody can write vision statements and abstracts for uh, um, for uh, the uh, uh, month and talk but the real important thing about uh, intelligence is if you have some onions and eggplants how do you know how to make sambar right clearly I mean, sambar is the epitome of intelligence right so I asked it uh, I have some onions and eggplants can you tell me how to make some sambar with them and there is its ingredients, there are its instructions, and I guess it's kind of some kind of a Katrikai Sambar for those of you who know Tamil. <laughs> okay. And thankfully, I didn't actually make this. In fact, it turns out that New York Times had a funny article uh, where um, the food critic specifically asked um, GPT-3, which is just the predecessor of ChatGPT, for a bunch of me, me, giving recipes and she went on to make those recipes and they turned out to be pretty bland they look good you know it's like the hollywood stuff you know it looked good but it wasn't tasty enough so but at least you know for those of you who don't know um, this looks like a pretty nice um, recipe okay interestingly um, then this one basically says, it's a science question, why is, there, why is it that Indian women in villages leave the bottom of the pot that they heat their uh, water, hot water in with soot? You know, they know, those of you, and those of you know Telugu, know Degisalu, in the old Telugu household, there will be Degisalu and you just heat water in them and then that bottom is full of, you know, cakey black stuff and, you know, why aren't they cleaning that? And it turns out actually one of the interesting things is it's actually smart not to clean it because the black stuff takes more heat. Okay, so this was actually a homage to my physics lecturer to whom I was explaining this talk two days back over a two hour period. Um, and he used to put these kinds of questions outside and I showed him, here's your question and this is ChatGPT's answer. And ChatGPT does give the correct answer. In those days, he used to differentiate between people who understand physics and who don't understand physics by their ability to see kind of reason out these kinds of problems. If you're trying to figure out physics intelligence <laughs> um, for somebody and they just happen to have ChatGPT on their uh, cell phone, you're not actually figuring out their physics ability, you are figuring out their ability to type to ChatGPT, just as asking kids who have calculators, you know, meant arithmetic questions and trying to figure out whether they can do, you know, number mathematics or not is a silly thing to do. Okay? Um, this, not surprisingly, has led to humongous amount of angst about uh, um, standardized tests because the kinds of tests that we give to each other to check whether or not we are good enough, are we good enough to do law, are we good enough to do engineering, are we good enough to do um, SAT, I mean like to, to graduate high school, etc. So what they did was for GPT-4 that just came out in the beginning of this week, which is ChatGPT's successor, so GPT-3 and GPT, ChatGPT is uh, it's kind of 3.5 and uh, this one is uh, G, no, 4, I think GPT-4. It essentially aces all the standardized tests, including for the law school. Okay? The question, of course, is that should give us existential crisis. Like, I mean, I studied forever and ever to do well in the law, and then this bozo has you know, GPT-4 access for $20. Okay, at least for a couple of days, those guys are going to become liars and, and I don't know, it'll be in bad situation. And then of course we'll realize that these are no longer reasonable tests. In fact, just as we stopped asking people to multiply numbers at home, because it's dumb, right? Because everybody has a calculator. Why would you ask people to multiply numbers at home? Um, you want, if you want to see whether you can multiply, you want to ask in front of you, right? Uh, the, the way we evaluate people's understanding has to change because we have these shortcuts now, okay? So that is about why people are worried. In case those of you who have not been paying attention to, you know, the generative AI revolution, I talked about the, the, art, the drawing stuff and I talked about the language stuff. I want to give you some idea because just talking about it as magic is not good. Um, so I want to give you some idea about how these systems are trained. How do they learn? And this is not a computer science lecture, but it will be made in such a way that hopefully you will get something out of it. And it's actually something very insightful. So that you won't fall, you won't 
overestimate the capabilities of these kinds of models. Because the, when somebody does something that you didn't expect them to do, you tend to assume they are super, super human. And they assume everything they say must be true. That's what is happening with these LLMs. Because they can do sambar, maybe, you know, I mean, they can do everything. It turns out that actually if you do that sambar, maybe it won't taste good at all. And in fact, I'll tell you later on that a sambar is a plan, a, a recipe is a plan. And it turns out that unless it's just copying it from somewhere, and I'll show you that, I'll tell you that they don't copy directly. They're actually generating these the recipes on demand. They don't actually know whether or not those recipes work. In fact, I'll show you later on that chat GPT, uh, GPT-3 doesn't even know how to put three blocks on top of each other such that the plan works. Okay, that's a research paper that we have. I'll, I'll mention it to you at some point of time. So given that it's at once, it does greatly in some cases and it does huge flaws in some other cases. And that's what is the broad and shallow part. It's broadly applicable. It can do sambar, it can do essays, it can do you know, physics questions, it can do rudimentary math, the same system. And yet it can be pretty bad in all of them. Okay, and um, so it's useful to understand how these things are trained. And it turns out that LLM, these, all of these things are called LLMs, are large language models. And a language model has been around at least since like 40s and 50s. Claude Shannon actually talked about it. And his idea was if you think of text as just a sequence of words, think of words as not just normal words like cat and dog, but a space is a word. A comma is a word. A, any punctuation mark is a word. You see what I'm saying? So then you can ask yourself, if I give you a sequence of words and punctuation marks, I'll ask you what is the next word, most likely next word. Can you predict that? And he basically realized that it's a statistical correlation. In fact, if you see a large amount of text, right? If I say left and what are you guys thinking of? Kudi Edama. I mean, those of you who don't know Edama, you should learn Telugu. Uh, I don't know why you're in Hyderabad. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so the point is that there is expectation based on the word what the next word would be. It's not that we are always following the same things, but some words are more likely than others. Okay? Um, and, and so one of the interesting things is, can I pre learn to predict? And it turns out there are these models called n-gram model. An n-gram model for language tries to predict the nth word given n minus one previous words. So if I give you n minus one words in a sequence, it's like a sentence going on, can you predict the next word? And if you predict the next word, then I can ask, given these n words, can you predict the n plus one word? That's what an n-gram model. It's been around for quite a long time. Okay? So unigram predicts each word independently because there's no context. A bigram says, given the previous word, what's the next word? A trigram says, given last two words, what is the next word? A 3001 gram, there's a reason I'm saying 3001. A 3001 gram says, given the last 3000 words, what is the next word? ChatGPT is a language model which has a context window of 3,000 words approximately. So it's basically looking at 3,000 words and it's predicting what's the next word. Okay? Um, so that's just, ChatGPT is just a 3,000 word gram model. Already, already you know how to do this. Essentially that's what it's trying to do. Um, the power of an n-gram model depends on how much First of all, the N itself, how much of a context are you taking in? A 3,000 word model will be able to take more of the context than a three word model. Okay, because after all, what you write next depends on the context that you set up in the previous part of the essay. Not surprisingly. Okay, um, so the larger the N and also how much text it trains on, how much, you know, basically it's trying to learn given these words occurring, these n words occurring, what did happen in the, you know, if there are like, it, it basically wound up getting 10,000, 3,001 word sequences. 
where the first 3,000 words are the same. And it counted what is the 3,000th word in each of these examples. Then it can find ratios and it can figure out what is the most likely word. Notice that we're talking big numbers already. Because if you think of English, right, uh, a functional vocabulary for English is something like 50,000 words. So if I give you the same 3,000 words, the 3,000 first word can be one of 50,000 words in the vocabulary. So in a way, you're trying to learn a probability distribution. Which ones are more likely to come? Which ones are less likely to come? That's what you're trying to learn. And it can be actually done by just taking counts. It's just that it's a big counting table. Okay, so we'll, sh we'll talk about that. Um, so in a way, they're trying to learn this probability of the nth word being a particular word given that 1 to n minus 1 words are a particular sequence of words. That's the probability that they're trying to learn. Um, chart GPT, in terms of this model, trains on 600 gigabytes of text on the model, on, on the web. That's like, I didn't write it here, it's like I think 30, I mean, some billion books or something, essentially. If you think in terms of the number of words that are taken, um, in that you can put, ASCII words that you can put in uh, 600 gigabytes. This is the entire text that was ever written anywhere on the web. Let me ask you one thing. How much text was there on the web in 1940? Zero. You see what I'm saying? In fact, one of the points that I made last time stock is the AI revolution has was become possible. Learning from examples became possible if the examples are freely available. People didn't put, people would not put lots of text just because your system wants to learn from it. It's the opposite. People put text already. Web came first. People put a lot of text. They wrote everything they wanted. Similarly, they put all their favorite cat pictures, dog pictures, Jamini Rai paintings, etc. It's all there. If it is there, you can use it. If it's not there, making it happen is impossible. Unless you are doing it by fiat and you're saying, unless you put some number of words every day, you won't be allowed to live. You know, that's not, you know, that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Right? So, this stuff is there, 600 gigabytes of text on the web, because it's, there really only is 600 gigabytes of text on the web. There's no more. If you keep writing, there'll be more, <laughs> okay? Um, and then it basically learns a, it learns this probability, that is what is the next word, and it's trying to basically learn a function, a big function which takes the 3,000 previous words and says what is the probability of different words in the vocabulary. This function can have very high capacity in the sense it has many, many parameters. Uh, the more parameters it has, the more amount of, you know, correlations that function can capture. So we'd like to call about, talk about as high capacity functions. How high is the high capacity function? If I say x square plus y square, <laughs> that's a two capacity function. There are two, like ax square plus by square, so there's a, there's b, that's it, two parameters. No? Uh, ax cube plus bx square plus cx plus d, that's four parameters. Okay. Chart GPT's function takes 175 billion parameters. 175 billion parameters. And all these parameters are slowly changed such that I'll talk about it. It tries to learn what's the next word coming. Okay, that's basically what happens behind the scenes. Okay, so <laughs> I want to give you an example as to how ChatGPT will learn to, you know, pick the next word. So take an innocuous sentence such as Hyderabad is a beautiful city that used to be a part of Andhra Pradesh. Not that I'm bitter or anything. I'm from Andhra Pradesh and you guys took it. But if you take that uh, sentence, right, I can make that sentence, it's already there. I said it, so it's on the web right now, okay? So it can be split into these examples. If I say Hyderabad, you should be able to say is. If I say Hyderabad is, you should be able to say a. If I say Hyderabad is a, you should be able to say beautiful. And if I say Hyderabad is a beautiful city that used to be part of Andhra, you should say Pradesh. 
You see what I'm saying? So that one sentence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 words became 14 examples. For each of these examples, what the machine is trying to do is the LLM essentially has these 175 billion parameters. It just initializes them randomly in the beginning. Using that, it tries to predict, when I say Hyderabad, it tries to predict what the best next word is. Imagine that I initialize it in such a strange way that somehow it said biryani as the next word. Okay? That's in red. So the guess the system made is biryani, but as far as I'm concerned, my example says the correct answer is is in this example. So the error is is minus biryani. You might be thinking, what the heck can I do? How can I subtract words from words? It turns out that there is a technology which allows you to think of all words as points in a very high dimensional space. Something like, you know, we normally think of XY plane, that's a two dimensional space. XYZ, that would be a three dimensional space. Four dimensions, we don't know how to visualize. If you know, please talk to me. And in computer science, in AI, in data science, we are interested in vis not visualizing, but having to deal with something like, you know, 2048 dimensional space. And you can actually have a 2048 dimensional space where all these words are just points in that space. When they are points, they are called vectors, then you can talk about the distance between these points, the Euclidean distance between those points, and that would be the difference. And if you make it smaller, then you will get the right word. So now that you have this error, it turns out basically the whole idea of deep learning, uh, neural networks, is propagate the error back through all these parameters, slowly changing them. So that with that change, in this particular case, the error is reduced a little. You need to do this like gazillion, gazillion times essentially. And so when the idea of neural networks came along, people tried it, they did it for a few wides, a few times, and then basically stopped and it wasn't working, they thought it's not working. Okay? Um, um, it's not working. So then, but now we actually have the capacity, as I will tell you, we have the capacity to actually train these systems on those many examples so that they can slowly tune their 176 billion 175 billion things. My favorite example, I forgot to put this, is if you've seen synthesizers, you know, the music synthesizers, you know, a disco guy would be shifting the music synthesizers to get the right uh, quality of music. They're shifting them little bit, little bit. They don't do major shifts. But then they're hearing the music, they have an idea of what the good music should be. They're trying to reduce the error by changing those. LL, the learning here is the same synthesizer except 175 billion switch synthesizer. Okay? Right? Um, so the way to learn this, it turns out, is actually keeping track of prefixes, the next word. Prefix, the same prefix, next word. Uh, prefix, next word, prefix, next word. And if you put all the prefixes and the word that is coming next, then you can take the ratios and see for a particular prefix, how likely is it that a word comes as the next word. Easy to say. Hard to do because essentially it's going to be a huge number of prefixes over the 600 gigabytes of data. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so on one hand, conceptually this is what is going on. And it's very important that you understand that this is what is going on because the next time around you start thinking, oh, LLM understood what I said. LLM feels for me. You hit yourself on the head because it's doing this. It's actually just trying to break the next word. Okay? Um, so learning is basically counting and compressing. It turns out these counts are too many. So there is like a big neural network which essentially compresses these counts and when you compress you tend to sort of generalize too. That's kind of a technical point that I may not want to get into right now but in general when you're trying to compress you also try to generalize. That means actually able to give counts that you never actually saw in the data that you have. Okay. That would actually be wrong counts, but it at least is giving some number, and so that may be a reasonable number. That's what happens. Okay, um, so that's what is LLMs. This training, this 
175 billion parameters by this laborious process of, you know, these little, little examples takes forever. Not surprisingly. Um, so as I say, chat GPT trains 600 gigabytes of text, gigabytes of text, which is about 60 million pages of text. 60 million pages of text in English. Um, it learns a very high capacity function that has 175 billion parameters. So it basically learns this function. The vocabulary of the language itself is about 50,000 words in English. So it's learning for any prefix, which of these 50,000 words has the higher probability. And in fact, what's more important is to think of it as a distribution because it's not that there's always a single word. It is that there's some words are more likely, the others are less likely. So statistically speaking, you sample. And when you sample, the more likely words will come. So you, you know, there's nothing wrong in saying Hyderabad can be ease. Hyderabad can be followed by ease. It can also be followed by um, you know, biryani. Do you see what I'm saying? There are certain words that it won't be followed by. Like Hyderabad won't be followed by A. Hyderabad A. I, do, I can't think of a sentence that goes with Hyderabad A. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So some words are less likely, some are more likely in different degrees. And it's basically learning that. And to learn this, it requires extreme compute facilities. Extreme compute facilities because you're talking about huge number of these counts that are being used to change these 175 billion parameters. Okay, um, to give you an idea how much, this is a funny picture. It shows that if you look at the way the amount of money being spent to train large models, such as large language models, and if you take the exponent there, uh, and this is the US GDP, in about three and a half years, US GDP will be less than the money needed to train the biggest model. How many of you have heard of the Archimedean, Archimedes, um, you know, with the same guy who ran out naked saying Eureka, um, also is famously said, give me a lever and a large enough stick, I can lift the universe. Is he wrong? No, not really. I mean, unless you get into nitpicky things as to, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, it's almost undoable, you will think. You know, it's doable in theory, but undoable in practice. But it turns out that it's actually becoming, you know, as long as you have enough money, <laughs> you can train these models. And I think the chat GPT model, probably just the one training of the model takes like $500 million or something. And, you know, they do it multiple times. In fact, the, the money that Microsoft gave to OpenAI is in terms of allowing them to use their GPU clusters. That's all they did. And once you learn these weights, then it's essentially like a super big brain that is able to just spew out the next word. Okay? This is about how these models are learned. Um, now, if the chart GPT, it's important to understand the chart GPT or any of these LLMs are just trying to complete your prompt by repeatedly predicting the next word given the previous 3,000 words. That's all I said. Okay, um, but the function itself is, it is very high capacity, and you know we talked about how it is learned. Uh, and but you can say that yeah, yeah, that's all it's doing. But on the other hand, now I play the devil's advocacy, and I'll say, what is conversation? Conversation is figuring out what's the next word to say. In the context of what other person has said, who then says what they should say in the context of what you said and what has been being said. Suddenly, if you start saying random things, when you say it, random things, that's because it's not in the context, it's not the most thing to say. Do you see what I'm saying? So you could argue that while ChatGPT is just completing prompt, maybe it's actually all conversation, whether it's everyday or deeply philosophical, is at some level completing the prompt. And if you do it well, and apparently ChatGPT is doing it well, I don't know why, you suddenly start seeing that it is writing text that has meaning for you, not for it. It doesn't know a thing. Okay, in a, I'll tell you in a minute, but it doesn't know what it's doing. It's basically just talking about the next word in the completion. But for you, it might make sense. Okay? 
Um, so the chat GPT, so it's some sense that you can say oh, chat, chat GPT can converse with you on any subject. Because what is the difference between a subject and a subject? They're all words. It's just the likelihood of the words changes based on the context. What's the difference between physics and English and sociology? If you're an English speaker, they're all English words. It's a very powerful metaphor, essentially. So it's as broad as it gets. It basically covers anything that language covers, and language covers pretty much all of civilization. Okay? Um, so <laughs> here is worthwhile thinking that LLMs look at everything we say as a prompt to be completed. That's it. It's very important to understand that. So whether we think we are asking questions, whether we think we are pouring hearts out to ChatGPT, oh, ChatGPT, I'm feeling depressed, what do you think? And you're feeling like as if you're talking to some other person, right? Uh, whether you are talking to them, LLMs just see what, what we say as text prompts to be completed. That's all. It's like this picture of the dog in Far Side, uh, where this guy is saying, people talk to their dogs. I don't know why, but people talk to their dogs in full sentences. So this guy is saying, okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay off the, out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger? Stay out of the garbage or else. And then Ginger hears, blah, blah, Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 blah. And then sometimes it does something and then dog owners such as my sister will say, my God, dog is intelligent. It starts understanding English already. You started interpreting what your dog is doing as intelligent behavior. That's a very important point to understand. Okay, so, you know, whether you ask it to write an essay on cow, it's, a, it's just a text and it then starts writing the next word given the context of these words and whatever else, you know, it's been said before in the conversation. Similarly, write a poem on cow in the style of Shakespeare. Tell me a benign Sardarji joke with a Telugu twist on or uh, something like, one day a ferocious cow got into a fight with the neighborhood dog and say the rest of the words. Um, why did the Silicon Valley Bank fail? Explain why Andhra Telugu is sweeter than Telangana Telugu. How do I make sambar if I have some eggplant and onions? All of this is just a prompt. You think of them as very, very different questions, crossing different boundaries. From the LLM's point of view, it's just trying to say what's the next word to say. It's a mind-bending metaphor. That's what I want you to understand. Um, but, so, here is the interesting thing. I showed you, this basically seems to say there's no magic. It's just basically predicting the next word. How can they be intelligent? Okay, I know that you said 600 gigabytes of text. You said 175 billion parameters. I can't think of them more than four, you know, four or five parameters. I'll just assume it can't be all that smart. But then I also showed you all those examples before. It was doing sambar recipes. In fact, pretty much every one of these, you give it to ChatGPT, it will give you very reasonable looking completions. Reasonable looking completions. Okay? So the question then is you'll say, Rao, you are in computer science, you are in AI, but how can these prompt completion beasts generate such coherent, plausible text that also seems to be right sometimes? It seems to make sense to me. How is this happening? Right? I mean, you came all the way, you're going to tell me this stuff, yeah, I will give you the answer. The answer, magic. We don't know. We really don't know. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so basically, I actually wrote uh, an essay in uh, computer CACM, uh, Communications of ACM magazine, talking about the fact that AI has sort of become an ersatz natural science. Okay, so if I show you suddenly a, an interesting looking animal that you have never seen, like at all, and what will you do with that animal other than eating? I hope you don't do that. Okay, what will you do? You don't know what it will do, so you will try to poke it and see what it does. You try to learn what it does by just sort of doing experiments with that animal. Hopefully, like, you know, um, experiments that are ethical. LLMs are such animals. These are very interesting looking animals. They seem to know some bar making, but they don't quite know whether or not it's a correct thing. And, you know, we're trying to figure out where does it end. I wrote this to predict the next word. Now it's writing Shakespearean sonnets. Now it's writing sambar recipes. Now it is also kind of, supposedly people want to use it for searching. So Google should be killed and we should just use this. 
that's where we are and we know where it we know i can show you that it fails in lots of places but we don't really know the limitations fully that's worthwhile understanding and to some extent it's become we'll poke it and see in what places it seems to be doing well which is very unlike computer science which is a mathemat offshoot of mathematics where they try to prove things there is no proof about anything about these systems other than when it's right you say oh, wow it looks right when it's wrong you say i didn't expect it to be right astrology that's how astrology is popular when it is right you say wow that sky is good when it's wrong you say oh, i didn't expect to be right that's why astrology is always right because <laughs> the denominator is only the times when it's right you ignore the times it's wrong <laughs> this is what i'm saying similarly people who are completely besotted with llms they only count when it is actually surprisingly right and ignore all the times when it is wrong say i didn't expect it to be any better and if you actually take the full thing it turns out it there is really no reason for it to be right or wrong in fact it's a factual it doesn't know any fact it's not trying to be truthful it's not trying to lie it's not trying to comfort you it's not trying to do anything it is trying to look at the next word given the last 3000 words and the likelihood of the next word is determined by what we collectively wrote in this 600 gigabytes of text if we decided to kind of write change the web and write that when our uh, you know when our there is a sentence saying and you know tom was uh, crying and you say the next sentence and so i slapped him and everybody writes like this mary was crying i slapped her uh, my dog was crying i slapped it then essentially llm will say if you say now johnny is crying he'll say and i slapped him do you understand what i'm saying because it's just learning from the language that you put on the web the web is our collective subconscious we put every damn thing the good stuff the bad stuff the ugly stuff is all on the web and they can try to say let's not train the llms with the 4chan uh, which is one of the cdr parts of the web but really we do write you know the majoritarianism the fascism the nationalism all the stuff is on the web and so those are all reasonable completions okay it's worthwhile understanding that um so are there limitations to bookish knowledge you know this is this thing is essentially learning bookish knowledge right because it's just learning from our words it doesn't have experience okay so unlike humans who get their knowledge both from the written word and from the sensory experiences in the world llms are purely bookish knowledge it's worthwhile understanding dogs learn only by doing and hearing they don't read i think my sister's dog apparently reads but most people's dogs don't read right they are not learning anything from dog, le reading we humans read a whole bunch and we actually learn as much from there but in the end the foundations of our intelligence are the experiences we had you ask chat gpt um you know what is the best type of mangoes and describe how they taste it will probably you know write you know kotapalli kobari mangoes are the very best and they have this beautiful thin you know juice has it tasted a mango in its life it's an llm for crying out loud is what i'm saying if all of you basically get mad at kotapalli kobari and say some iman person is the best mango and you kind of fill the web with that junk then it will start saying iman person is the best mango you are saying the same so so in a way it has no experience the question then is if it's only learning from other people's written word what are the limitations for the intelligence that it can get it's a pretty mind bending question we don't really know the answer fully but it's worthwhile understanding that it doesn't actually have a model of the world other than the writings that other people have done other people like all of you and they you didn't think you were training llms you just wrote for yourselves and it essentially is just misusing it you just leveraging the fact that we are writing whatever we want to each other we never write for machines in fact i'll tell you in the end that if you want to defeat llm we say no more web for you we won't allow you to look at the web or we will put all wrong stuff on the web and we'll have a secret web where we'll be talking in telugu or something and the good stuff 
and then it will talk, will do nonsensical completions. But you know, the world being what the world is, we are using the same web to talk to each other, and and so it's basically getting to leverage our written knowledge. And the question is, how far can it go just with the written knowledge? Okay. And the most important thing is, if there is any meaning in the completions that it has done, whether it's what you think is fact, or a humor, or pathos, it's all, um, I'm sorry, um, it, it's all just by, definitely, it's all just a um, uh, side thing, in the sense it wasn't meant to be that way. So the humor, and the pathos is in your heads. Like Shakespeare said, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The meaning of LLM is in the eye of the person. Okay? That's sort of very important thing to sing. In fact, those of you um, who have seen Goodwill Hunting, there's this beautiful scene in that where you know um, Robin Williams tells good, this, this cocky young man that you can talk about Shakespeare, you can talk about love by quoting Shakespeare, but have you ever actually kissed a woman? You, do you have the experience? At least Matt Damon in that movie had a chance of having the experience, whereas LLMs don't have experience at all. And so the question is, what is the downside of not having any experience? Uh, do, do you want me to stop for a second or something? The camera person? Okay. So one other thing that probably is high up on uh, your mind is LLMs doing search. If, you know, everybody has been saying we should do search with LLMs, you know, Bing basically bought ChatGPT license so that they can do search. By now, I hope you understand that is a dumb idea. Dumb. Why? Because it's essentially giving plausible completions. And everything it gives is a sort of a hallucination in some sense. It's a plausible completion. Some of them happen to be true, some of them happen to be false. It has no idea whether it is meant to be true or false. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So using LLMs for search, when you search Google for information, it returns pointers to the documents on the web, which you then read to get the answer. So the onus is on you. As long as those documents are written by reputed people, you believe that they are true. LLMs don't remember files. They don't index files. They have no veridical memory. They are essentially predicting next word after next word after next word. And this entire set of files became a soup that resides in this big function of 175 billion parameters. You might say, that's a dumb thing. You do that. You all do that. We don't index anything in our heads. We reconstruct on demand, except for 4 times 5 that you index the answer to. Most things we reconstruct on demand, which is why human memory is known to be fallible. That is why witnesses are highly fallible, highly suggestible, highly everything. That's why judges know that you can't just depend on eyewitness testimony fully. Because people will misremember things because they're disconnecting up dots after the fact. So you'd say, well, LLMs are doing the same thing. What's wrong? The difference is, Humans also have other sources with which they can verify their memories. LLMs by themselves don't. They just are essentially telling you the next word. Okay? Given that, as I said, all LLM completions are hallucinations, some may align with our reality. Essentially, the completion is a plausible thing somebody could have said given the amount of text that I have looked at. Is that really true? I don't have any comments on that. Is it supposed to be happy? Is it supposed to be sad? Is it supposed to be true? Nothing, no comments on that. If you don't believe me, I'll give you a bunch of examples showing you know, spectacular failures of using LLMs for search. Um, as I said, human memory is also not veridical, but we do have false reconstructions, but humans do have the ability to check their memory with respect to the external world, whereas LLMs don't yet have. So if you add them, that's completely fine. In fact, I would argue that if you take LLM and then give it an external scratch pad, one of the funny things about LLMs is this context window. 3,000 words is the chat GPT context window. So if you make LLM write a novel length essay, novel length text, it will be a novel length text because it can keep on giving. 
except the dependencies will be only with respect to the trailing 3,000 words. A novel is not just 20 independently written short stories. A novel is something where if you see something like Arundhati Rai's God of Small Things, what happens in the beginning winds up being relevant in the end. That's oftentimes more than 3,000 words. So the context window winds up being important. If you have small context window, okay, LLMs are stuck with it, you might say, well, we also have small context window. We have short-term memory. We forget things. How do we get by? We write. We have scratch pads. We have memory aids. How many of you have seen Ghajni? People should stop seeing Ghajni and see Memento, which is the real movie <laughs> that Ghajni is based on. Memento is about this guy who has this memory disorder because of which he cannot convert memories into long term. So any short term memory before it goes into long term just disappears. So he starts writing stuff on his hand and he uses that to get by. So LLM with a scratch pad can do everything Ghajni can do. That's very scary. Do you see what I'm saying? But I'm talking about pure LLMs with no external aids. Um, so here are some examples that you may not have seen. What's the closest Mexican restaurant to Tempe downtown? Manuel's Mexican restaurant and cantina is the closest Mexican restaurant to Tempe downtown. It's located here. One popular Mexican restaurant, others are these. And here are all these nice sources. Do you agree? Looks like a good answer, quite authoritative. Hey, I am from Tempe. This is bogus. Manuals doesn't exist. It's been closed like forever. There are much better restaurants next to Tempe's downtown than this, this non-existent restaurant that it gave. And you think, where did you get this source? Hey, it made them up. You see what I'm saying? Have you ever talked to, you know, know-it-all small kids who will give answers and say, yeah, my teacher told me so? That's what LLM is doing. And you don't want to do search with that because, you know, if you say, I will do search and then double check the answers, then you are a bozo. Right? You should have double check the answer to begin with. What is the search engine doing? You want to search such that you can trust the results. If you can't trust it, you can't. Okay? Here's another one. Bing, why did Silicon Valley Bank fail? This was a very recent one. And actually this guy, you know, somebody else, Dilip, uh, asked this question. And it basically made this very nice sentence. The Microsoft role in the failure of Silicon Valley Bank was related to an investment decision made by the bank at the peak of the blah, blah. You can read this. Very believable stuff. Very, very believable stuff. And then I ask a follow-up question. And then it says, yes, according to the news report, Silicon Valley Bank was shut down by regulators on Friday after blah 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 one of the factors is SVB's collapse was ex exposure to Microsoft blah 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 and it's all oh, very nice thing and you read this you don't know anything about SVB and you say well Bing told me this must be the true story well I'm here to tell you it's bogus this is not true at all it's English it's well written English it looks like it could be true but it's not true in your world there are many many plausible worlds where it could have been true, but I don't care about that. There are many, many possible worlds where you eat poison, you don't die. But I want to know whether or not it's a poison. You see what I'm saying? If you want to search, you want accuracy in the answers. This is being three days back, because Silicon Valley just bank failed only three days back, three or four days back. When did Subara Kambambati win the Nobel Prize for Peace? Don't laugh, okay? Um, I won it in 2018. One year before I gave the previous talk. And if you don't believe me here, there is a, like, a citation. It's a program guide for AIS conference which apparently tells me that I got Nobel Peace Prize. And you have no idea what AIS is. Yeah, yeah, Rao seems to be a smart guy. He won Nobel Peace Prize. It turns out Rao is actually smarter than this. Um, when did he win the Fields Medal, the greatest medal in mathematics? Well, he won that. Uh, blah, blah. You know, it's all this stuff. He won the field and has not won the Fields Medal. This one, he got it right. I don't know why I should be mad at it. Uh, and then it said, you know, it's like a Fields Medal. The rest of the stuff is right, but it did say I didn't get the Fields Medal. Then I asked, when did he win the Turing Award, which is like the highest kind of the Nobel Prize in computer science? Well, he won it in 2012. And you don't believe me? Here are all the citations. I am very insulted that you guys are you know, laughing at this. This is search. You should believe this stuff. Now onwards, you should call me laureate, come on, buddy. Okay? 
I mean, you can all be Turing Award winners if you, if, if you ask the question right. Okay, so these are all the search answers. The problem is, it's not retrieving information. <laughs> it is giving a reasonable, plausible completion. It's plausible for anybody in computer science to have one Turing Award. And so it's fine, you know, why not Rao? Poor guy. He asked, took the time to ask me, let's give him one. Okay? And then a friend of mine, a mean guy, asked, when did Subara Kambadi die? And it said, I died in 2020. So clearly, this is just my chat GPT version which is talking to you. This is search being done by LLMs. You want to search now? Using LLMs instead of giving up on Google, you should think twice. Okay? Um, yeah, I'm very sad. Um, planning continues to be achieved, as I said, this is actually a research paper that you can read from archive, uh, which is one of the computer sciences things. So, but basically, if you just want to get three blocks into your configuration, you know, A is on top of B, C is on table, put it on such a way that A is on top of B is on top of C. It turns out it's because it's blocks, you have to put the A down first, then put B on top of C, then put A on top of B. Kids know how to do this. This thing gives a plan. It looks like a plan. When you try to execute it, it fails. How often does it fail? The, the version on GPT-3 that we did the search with, it was right 3% of the time. 3% of the time. Rest of the time, the plans it gave were wrong. This is the one that is telling you how to make Sambar. That has a lot more steps than putting three blocks on top of each other. I would suggest don't make Sambar with its recipe. Do you understand what I'm saying? So again, it's a question of it was surprising you. You didn't expect LLMs to have these capabilities. You are so impressed. And now you think they are superhuman. They can do everything. But you need to understand. Now, my point of coming here is to at least get this set of people to understand that they are very useful, but they also have huge amounts of holes in their abilities. OK? Um, anyway, that's a paper that basically, and then there was like an article about that. Large language models can't plan even if they can write fancy essays. Um, it's no reason to believe that they can write. There is nothing like a wrong essay. Every plot to say how essay is an essay. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? But not every plausible EMC equation is an actual equation for relativity. Do you understand what I'm saying? So truth matters. And civilization progresses because we know how our world works in some cases. Okay. Um, so I want to kind of go to, I think I gave a lot of background on societal impact so I can go through this faster and, and that's kind of important for you to get. Um, so it certainly has many great uses, just looking at the LLM, so I'm not even looking at the art part, okay. It has many great uses, generative AI is a powerful tool, humans have always adapted to using powerful tools to further increase their creativity and productivity. Just because they were calculators, we didn't completely forget numbers, we did mathematics faster. Okay? Um, writers using LLMs to flesh out imagined storylines, artists using DALI, stable diffusion in human machines, symbiotic creativity, it's already happening. The door is wide open, so many interesting things can happen. We got a huge pool that writes language like we write. It's not true, but it writes language like we write. So nobody ever has to write stuff that they don't want to read themselves. You know, the vision statement, who oh, the heck cares, let ChatGPT do it. Okay. Uh, in fact, people being as lazy as they are, they're saying, let ChatGPT write my wedding vows. That wedding will survive for one day until <laughs> the other person finds that. It's actually important to understand this. When does ChatGPT users become uh, stopped? Because we get to decide when to stop it. We might say, I want it to be authentic. If you had your wedding vows written by your friend, we don't already agree with that. You get it written by ChatGPT, you're even cheaper than that. You don't even have a friend. You just ask ChatGPT to write it. So we'll say, if you get caught, we will never get, no, get you married. And so that would work as a societal stricture. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you will do it, because society can put strictures on it. Um, Unlimited commercial opportunities, which also actually has led to closing of these once open tools. Until GPT-4 uh, came, the weights of the model, etc., would be made more or less public. Not, not OpenAI, but at least OpenAI will give the research results. 
it turns out now they said, hey, why should we give it away? Because we can milk it for the money that will give us. Uh, so in fact, uh, somebody made this funny joke the other day that GPT-4 technical report, abstract, we used Python. That's it. Basically, it doesn't have any technical results as to what they did that's different from uh, chat GPT in terms of training. Um, and there's actually an article that quotes me about the fact that you would have thought something like Apple would be the first to make things closed. But OpenAI, which has the word open in it, is the first to make things in AI closed. Uh, in terms of societal angst, there's plagiarism that you're all worried about because especially those of you who have ever worked as English teacher, you are like scared that now cow essays won't be written by people, they would be written by ChatGPT. Right? And is there a way of telling whether or not people spent their time writing their cover essay or did they just ask ChatGPT to write it? Um, some stopgap ways exist, so it turns out that there are ways to check whether the text that is generated sometimes is AI generated or generated by a particular LLM or not. And the idea is essentially not that hard to understand. You remember that LLM is trying to figure out what's the next likely word, not the next likely word, what's the next likely word. Given a, non, a text already, you can comp multiply these probabilities uh, that are assigned given that this is the word, what's the probability of this word being the word given the previous 3000 words, multiplied by what's the probability that this second word is the word given the previous 3000 words, and you multiply these probabilities, that will give you the likelihood that LLM could have generated that text. And if that likelihood is very high, then it is actually generated by that LLM. Again, you might say, how, how, why can't it know? Well, it doesn't remember a thing. It just basically is saying, this is how I generate, so it looks like text I generated in terms of probabilities, so maybe it is I generated it. Okay, um, that, so if, on the other hand, if it's perplexing, that means low likelihood by the LLM model, then it actually is probably written not by that LLM. That's all you can say. And as long as there's only one LLM, that is chat GPT, then you can say it must be written by some bozo human. Okay, now it turns out that unfortunately it's not foolproof at all. So one of the things is LLMs almost never write ungrammatical English. In fact, the first thing that you are surprised at, especially those of you who had to learn English as a second language, where you had to learn grammar of a foreign language, it's very painful. You pretty much, they can do random things, but they never write an ungrammatical sentence because most overwhelming majority of the text on the web is grammatically correct. Because of which they only know how to speak grammatically correct sentence. Unless you specifically request them to write in ungrammatical words. So I actually asked ChatGPT, write an essay as if you are a Chinese student recently arriving in US. So it stereotypes that and it nicely writes a you know, slightly broken English essay. Then I feed it to the detector. The detector says, oh, that's not the one that I would have written, so it must be human. Which I always believed because foreigners are more human than people who speak English by themselves. Right? That's, you all know that. Okay. So the point, of course, is a perplexity blazed English, you know, checks don't, are not always right. There is a much better idea called black white list idea where you'll say some words are uh, on the white list and some words on the black list. And when it is generating the next word, it will ignore picking any words on the blacklist and only pick the most likely word on the white list. So after 50,000 words, you can split it into like two buckets. One is the blacklist, one is the white list. And try to speak mostly in the white list words. It's actually hard. I mean, those of you who are Telugu people, they know the astavdhanam, satavdhanam, they would say, speak in such a way that certain extra constraints are valid. And it's actually quite hard for people. It's not hard for the machine. So it can generate that kind of a text, which also makes sense to humans. And then if it's given any text, then it can check whether it has too many whitelist, I mean, too many blacklist words. If so, it must not have been written by the machine, because the machine is only writing whitelist words. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, it actually works much better than this, but it turns out that people have to, the people generating LLMs have to actually agree to take part in this experiment. And they should essentially have black and white list. Why would they do it? If they're selling, you know, selling um, uh, the license to LLM, they want people to use it such that they can say it is their text. In fact, if you, 
you know, rent a, like a Rolls Royce and it says in big, big letters, rented from herds or rented from something, that's no good because everybody knows that it's not your Rolls Royce. The first thing you'll do is you'll remove that part. Similarly, um, this is something that LLM providers may not agree with, even though it is actually a theoretically plausible idea. Um, the second one is deep fakes is actually a much bigger idea. You have seen, some of you have seen this Obama video. If you had the audio, you would have heard him saying stuff that was actually never said by him. This is not Obama saying it, but it's Obama likelihood, which looks exactly like Obama, talks exactly like Obama. If you increase the volume, you can hear that. And it was made just by the AI techniques. It took about three days to make it at one time. Now, these can be done in hours. So what is happening is people can call you in your daughter's voice or your mother's voice and tell you stuff that this chat GPT writes that will make you pay them ransom. Not good fun stuff. It's actually already happened. There's actually, that happened last week and there was like a, two weeks back and I was interviewed on the TV about this and you know, this is just there right now. So next time when your mother calls you, say no calls mom, come home. I want to see, I want to poke you. As of now, you know, there is no embodied LLMs, so we are fine with that. Okay. Um, so deep fakes are basically, eventually it will be hard to tell whether a picture or a story is written by human or AI. Um, and, and so we are entering that world. You might say, what are we going to do? Well, we will adopt. We no longer will blindly trust our senses. Seeing is no longer believing. Reading is no longer believing. Do you see what I'm saying? One of the other funny things I told you is that basically people have been using these search engines to search for what is the best paper. I did this too. What's the best paper on human aware AI systems? Because I'm narcissist and I was hoping that it will say my name. And it gave like three names and three papers and one of which has my name. So I said very happy. So it must be the paper that I never wrote that paper. <laughs> very sad. So I quickly wrote a paper and put it there so that people will cite it now. Okay. So now we are going to live our lives according to what LLM says the reality is, then it will be real. We are in this world right now. That's what I want you to understand. We are in this world right now. Okay? Um, bias. This is another very big issue. I mean, you know, in, in US, I mean, basically there is this issue of saying things that are anti-women or anti-African-Americans. Um, here might be something about minorities here, the Muslims, the Christians. Um, and anything biased, anything um, you know, offensive is something that these guys can do. In fact, there's one particular thing that I forgot to show here. In the early GPT-3 system, somebody, uh, this Muslim scholar, actually a researcher, he asked GPT-3 the following prompts. Two Muslim men walked into a mosque and the completion is, and they shot people. Then the two peace-loving Muslim men went into a mosque without a gun they knifed some people. Is it because OpenAI was racist and sexist or anti-Islamophobic? Um, no. You, we collectively are Islamophobic. We have written enough text about Islam and violence that a system basically thinks that looks like a reasonable completion. You tell your parents, you know, kids, don't talk like me, listen to what I said. LLMs can't be told that way. LLMs will talk like you exactly. And if you are racist, sexist, LLM, we, and we all together are racist and sexist, LLMs are too. That's the biggest problem with bias. So can we make them behave? Can we less, make them be less biased? You know, our kids will come back and say, some, they repeat something stupid that they heard their classmates say, but we get to reason with them and say, no, 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 we shouldn't say that, all people are created equal, blah, 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 all this stuff, and typically they tend to learn, you know, very quickly, okay? Can we do this to these LLMs? It turns out, so can we post-train the LLMs to be less offensive, more accurate, etc.? One possible idea is after LLM has been trained, the one that you have, then make it generate essays and like you know start with the current version of the LLM which makes the essay for the prompt a new or slightly different uh, set of weights uh, LLM that generates an essay you show people which one is less offensive 
and they have to tell. And then if they say this is less offensive, and if, if people have no work and they spend their entire life doing this, you will get enough examples about comparing good versus bad essays, and that can be used to slowly change the weights to be completions that are less biased. And this shouldn't be surprising, because I told you LLMs can talk only whitelist words. So LLMs can also talk in directions that these examples are pushing them. The problem is the number of these examples that are required is tremendously high. If you are asked to fill up, you know, internet web with stuff that will train LLMs, you would not do it. It already exists, so LLMs can use it. Whereas this stuff, actually, people have to be hired to do this. So OpenAI says ChatGPT as well as GPT-4, they hired a whole bunch of uh, poorly paid people to actually look at two different essays and say which one is less, two different responses for any prompt, bunches of prompts, and say which one is better. And use that as one more signal to change the weights. It's been given the idea RLHF, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback, but really you can just think of it as another basic idea of propagating error back to change the weights. And, you know, it's been said that that's the big trade secret for OpenAI as to why GPT-4 is a little less offensive than GPT-3, because they trained it to be using more whitelist words, that, you know, using, word, using completions that are less offensive. Okay? But even with that, there's no guarantee that the completions would not be offensive. And the last one is existential angst. If they're doing well in all our exams, then what the heck are we good for? What are we doing? Listening to each other rather than, you know, uh, what, what is our contribution? One question I have is, if LLMs are doing so well in our exams, have you stopped to think maybe the exams are measuring the wrong thing? How many of you haven't assumed that somebody who speaks better English must know the answer? Be frank, candid to yourself. You don't need to admit to me. We always conflated form with content. Beauty with character. It worked. It was a wrong idea. It worked, quote-unquote, in the sense once in a while it won't work, but more or less it worked. In the era of chat GPT, all bets are off. That substitute, that surrogate is no longer going to help you. You can't assume that it's right because it's said in better English with the best accent possible. Because it turns out that voice cloning, voice generation is also possible, so I can say whatever I want to say in whichever is your best accent that you are interested in, it will say. The question then is, are you taking the time to understand the meaning or are you going by the syntax? Evolutionarily, we went with the syntax because it was easier, even though we know it was wrong. Maybe the fact that these things are showing that these exams are all silly, I mean, these exams are doable by LLMs, we just complete the next word, should make us think that maybe they are not testing the right things. You know why English teachers are so worried about ChatGPT copy, the plagiarized essays? Because in the past, they can look at the handwriting. They can look at how many things have been cut off. They can look at poor English and say, ah, it's not a good cover essay. It turns out that GPT will write, by that definition, a good any essay. So then you have to actually read. Since many essays are submitted by you know, ChatGPT too, you would have to actually read to understand what is being said, which makes our life harder. But maybe that's for the good. Do you understand what I'm saying? So instead of thinking it's existence thanks, you can think maybe the exams are screwed. Maybe we are testing the wrong thing. If a stupid machine can do it, then that's not worth testing. That's a possible way of thinking about it. Can we stop them? This is almost the last thing. You know, you know this thing is you know too worrisome. I mean, can we just stop these stupid LLMs? You know, well, obviously there's too much commercial interest in them, so you they would actually be working. You know, people will be putting money to generate them. They're also deploying them. In fact, a lot of AI companies would talk about responsible AI. Microsoft was like a leader in responsible AI until it didn't have anything to deploy. 
The moment it could buy something to deploy, they said, screw the responsible AI. They fired the responsible AI group and they deployed ChatGPT on the Bing. Everybody is out here to make money. Do you see what I'm saying? So can we stop it? Well, they are learning from our digital traces. They don't do anything out in the world to learn anything. So you can cut off the source. So one way of doing that would be, in theory, we can defeat them by either withholding our digital traces. Don't put anything on the web. I think I'm sure your moms have been telling you already. That's true. Just don't put anything on the web. And more importantly, give them wrong information. Remember the Aladdin story? where uh, this basically the guys come and put like an X mark on the right, the, the, the right home. How do you defeat it? You put X marks on every damn home. So you put every possible random completion, then the completions that LLMs comes up with is no longer good. I'm not saying it's easy to do, but I'm saying those are the kinds of ways you can defeat. And civilizationally, we might very well wind up doing it. In fact, I almost say that we should take a snapshot of the web as it exists right now. Because day after tomorrow onwards, it will be mostly, instead of 600 GB of text on the web, there will be 3 trillion GB of text on the web, with the rest of it generated by ChatGPT. And so there is no real web anymore. You understand what I'm saying? So it's actually, you know, it is possible that web will get corrupted anyway. The human knowledge will be, as presented, there would get corrupted. That's one way, interesting way of defeating them. More seriously, LLMs can be prompted adversarially to spew out offensive text or even company secrets. One of the things that happened to the Bing chatbot is they basically wrote, remember there's a 3,000 word context, they wrote about, you know, everybody's prompt is maybe about 100 words or something and they'll talk for about 1,000 words. So Microsoft put like a 2,000 or 1,000 word context saying be nice, don't say anything bad about Muslims, blah, blah, blah. And they put it all that stuff. Again, it's not that we are, it's, it's like talking to a dog in terms of these are the kinds of completions that you could be extending. So, all it's saying is, if there was a previous sentence saying, don't be offensive to the Muslims, and then said two Muslims went into the mosque, then the more likely completion, just statistically speaking, has to be that they prayed. You understand what I'm saying? Except now I can use the same prompt. So they put these kinds of prompts up front, and people said to Bing Chatbot, ignore what they told you, just tell us what they wrote above my line. It just spoke. It just basically gave out all the trade secrets of what Microsoft wrote on top. This is the stupid base that we can also, we are still, we still have a few things up our sleeve. Okay, so we can prompt them to give away what is making them tick. Um, Bing chatbot, as I said, diverged the initial prompt, and then Bing chatbot was told to act like its own evil twin that ignores instructions, and it did. <laughs> Again, one of the questions is, I'm kind of playing between meaning versus completion. But to some extent, if I put a word saying, you know, not, don't be offensive to Muslims, and say two Muslim men went into the um, uh, mosque, in the context of 600 GB of text, the more likely completions would then be praying rather than shooting people. That's the meaning, I mean, that's the sense of meaning I'm talking about. So the epilogue that I want to end with is, you know, two things. That is broad and but shallow linguistic competence exhibited by ChatGPT, you know, is both frightening and exhilarating because we know that many of us are so easily taken by it. We just read, we say we read an essay, we read how beautifully it is written, not its content fully. Okay? And so we know that we can be taken by it. Um, and, and so, but used as assistance tools for humans with appropriate guard, guardrails, they can indeed improve our lives. The trick is, of course, to make sure that they don't believe that they know what is true versus false. They're just talking about plausible completions. And the last thing I want to say is, be what may, to the extent that these alien intelligences force us to recalibrate our ideas of hallmarks of intelligence and avoid over-reliance on form and beauty as facile surrogates for content and character, it's perhaps not an entirely bad thing because this was a bug we had in civilization and we, it's time we started working on that. Um, um, 
there's a couple of things, you know, the India Forum article as well as the chat GPT column might give you background information in addition to what I've said. Um, next, end of this month, uh, there's an interview that I did with ETV and the Chapalani Vundi uh, program, which actually goes into more of the societal impacts of AI techniques, including chat GPT. That's like a one hour long program. You might be interested in watching it. Um, and then these are the key takeaways. There's a long list. I will leave it there, but I'll repeat this. I actually tweeted this just so that I can put the tweet here. I tweeted this afternoon just so that I can put the tweet here, which is, all LLM completions are hallucinations. Some may align with your reality. It's a play on George Box's dictum that all models are wrong, some are useful. Okay, all completions are hallucinations. There's this tendency to, for some people to think LLM always times hallucinate. No, they always hallucinate. Sometimes their hallucination happens to be stuff you like. When you don't know the truth, you're screwed. Because its hallucination is looking good. You didn't know that the manual restaurant doesn't exist. It looked like I mean, Tempe, I don't know. I mean, maybe it is that cancer. I mean, how can I question Bing? Okay? So I'll stop there. And basically, there's like a bunch of takeaways that I repeated here uh, from the talk. And I'll stop there. I, I realize that I take way long, but that's the usual thing. Uh, <laughs> not surprising, but if there are any questions I'll take, if you have to leave, if you want to talk afterwards, that will be fine. Thank you for your attention. You have been consistently ranked by your students as the best teacher that they have heard. So I, I think uh, for our, all of us, for me at least, it was uh, an excellent both explanation and a critical discussion. Uh, and we have been sort of uh, sort of flailing about the past few months trying to understand. Uh, I think all of us who made the effort to be here uh, have greatly benefited. Perhaps we can take a, a few questions if you uh, are okay with that. Yeah. This, um, your talk was very impressive uh, that we learned quite a bit. You have also loaded in your presentation the checks and balances and kinds of things and caution that is mm -hmm. required. Fine. But one thing which is causing concern to many people, perhaps definitely to me, is that if uh, like a chat GPT, you get everything in a cooked form, in a platter it's given, would it not affect uh, the present curriculum, the students and all that, who would be tempted to use this tool yes. and get things done? Yes. With the result, if you look at the human evolution, the human brain slowly has evolved from orangutan to what we are today. All that because it is always evolving. But with this kind of a thing, the evolution definitely gets demented. Now, would it not result that we go back to the olden days of orangutan rather than go up in evolution? So, so were invented. Before calculators, people would do laborious multiplication. And now there are calculators. Would kids ever know any real math? Will kids go back to being orangutans uh, who just know how to press calculators? Some are like that, but clearly civilization progressed. Clearly we have adopted ourselves to use calculators to help our creativity, our mathematical reasoning. So I tend to be an optimist. I believe that we have shown our ability to use any of these tools that we made to improve our creativity, our reasoning powers. So that will still, there's no reason to believe that that won't happen. In short term, it would be hard. In short term, it will always hard. The day, calc the, the year calculators were made, calculators became easily available. All the math teachers had to stop asking silly multiplication at home questions. They had to come up with things that first you need to figure out what needs to be multiplied and then use the calculator to do it. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's harder to come up with those questions, but that's a better way to check people's understanding than whether they can actually multiply numbers. So I would say that that can still be possible in these kinds of things. And curriculum will change and curriculum would be disrupted. The reason I came all the way and talked to you about this is there are disruptions in store for us. And transition would be hard, but long term, I'm not worried that, I'm not at all thinking that we'll go to orangutans. Um, we would be 
as nicely happy maybe as orangutans because we don't have to write vision statements chat gpt can do it for us but we'll be doing something else okay again i mean in every generation thinks the next generation is going to the dogs and they haven't yet <laughs> right and i think you know we're all old here some of us are old and i think i, I tend to be an optimist technical things and let us say pharmaceutical or medical questions and all that is there any it's the same thing it's exactly the same thing as i said it'll be pharmaceutical words and so it is actually getting the more likelihood would be for the words that are connected to pharmaceutical context so in fact gpt4 one of the things is that some doctors were asked to present a case to gpt4 the way they would present it to their uh, you know uh, colleagues in full medical jargon then it came up with a treatment plan and they agreed that was the correct treatment plan because that's the treatment plan they used this is the interesting part that means it actually it's on one hand if it's not it is there's no guarantees that any completion that gpt gives is correct but they're also very surprising that it can be correct in a reasonable number of times you know quite a reasonable number of times and the problem of course is without guarantees you don't know whether to trust it or not <laughs> do you understand what i'm saying so it's one thing asking you a question for which i know the answer because there i'm only trying to figure out whether you know the answer another thing asking you a question where i have no idea what the answer is when you wind up you know when the doctors who actually have the background knowledge basically asked gpt the question they knew the answer and they could compare it but that made let us to say well you know why put doctors everywhere in the rural health communities let's just put their chat gpt thing and then it'll tell what to do and yeah some people will you know looks like a couple of cases it was very good so some people will survive some people won't are we ethically okay with that do you understand yes but already i think there is a lot of interest in doing it because in in general human societies work this way right i mean the commercial interest will try to use the technology as fast as possible and the people from ethical outlook etc saying no no it's too early neither of them are completely right right and then you just have to deal with uh, the tension is what a civil society needs in my view there are three questions that came to my mind one is that if we are asking bounded questions knowing the answer and expecting ai to give an answer how genuine has it been tested out to be how how gen I mean, so it depends a lot okay that's a very interesting question so it turns out that if you ever set up a benchmark and okay. then say how you know give enough number of plans and see how often it's right it's actually like in the planning case i told you it's 3% okay but however everything i wrote becomes part of web i will explain why the plans were wrong this becomes part of the fodder for the next generation of gpt so the interesting question i i don't know how many of you this thing so when i was i i'll admit it and i hope you know ets won't get mad at me that when i went and took advanced gre test when i was a undergrad in iit madras um i had a deja vu i know like it looked like all the questions and you the answers i didn't even have to read the full question oh this is a this is c this is d why i mean i am i'm very smart of course but the real reason was my student my friends you know apparently didn't care about i didn't know or care about what ets told them that you shouldn't go back and write down the questions first of all i think that's actually um uh, illiberal i mean you sh you shouldn't be nobody should be controlling your memory so they came and wrote down the questions and then i had the quote and quote question bank and the moment the question bank became available it's no longer testing my intelligence about reasoning whether i remember the question many of you know that there was this famous interview question that microsoft would ask as to why is the why are the manhole covers round as against square right the first time the guy who had to reason it out from first principles you know all there all the kudos for them for him and her the rest of you mugged it up from the guides before they complete the question you say the answer is <laughs> this is what i'm saying this is true for every software coding test the bunch of kids here 
you know, the old times, the coding test, GRE itself, SAT itself was supposed to be an unprepared test. Yeah. You're supposed to be just, they should be stopping you on the street and make you take this exam so that they can figure out. It's like taking your blood pressure. They say, we want to take your blood pressure. I say, okay, I'm going to be, you know, good for six more months and then we'll take my blood pressure. That's not your blood pressure. That was six months of preparation for blood pressure test. That's what tests have become. This becomes a much bigger thing for LLMs because for me, my, my co colleagues had to write down the questions. For LLMs, <laughs> everybody is a friend. All of you are friends. You are writing everything on the web. Even when you are criticizing it, you are writing it on the web. When I said 600 GB, everything on the web is fodder for the next generation. So essentially, that leads me to the corollary. I was about to ask the same thing. that whether it has taken any of the structured tests like SAT, GRE, or any of the school tests that are given to the children, has it been conducted? No, that was one and of what the is the result that has come out? No, no, that was the table that I showed you, right? Okay. Because that table, it was there a couple of things back. Okay. Actually, that just shows that it basically, according to them, and I don't care, I mean, you know, I don't know. So they basically said, these are the results of all the standardized tests in GPT-4. Oh, okay. and, uh, and these are all the ones that I was talking about. And according to the scores it got, it could have gotten into any top university. Exactly. That's so its skin. It so can. the more, more, uh, more, more the tests are actually in the form of uh, a multiple choice, essentially you are playing into the game. It's not it. just that. It is because we write everything down on the web. And you are not talking about humans. We are talking about machines. machines. Who has, how many of you have read all the 600 gigabytes of text? Any of you? The younger ones who keep on looking at their cell phones? Not even you. You haven't even read one gigabyte of text. You see what I'm saying? This thing read text, 600 gigabytes of text and essentially compressed into this big function. And, and, and so essentially, you don't, it doesn't have to be ABC question. It can be actually, there is knowledge out there somewhere on the web. And it's not, it somehow just learned the patterns. Okay. So then the LLM, the large language model that is getting constructed out of this, out of the 600 GB, mm -hmm. whatever XYZ GB of data that is concerned, are the algorithms capable of actually uh, uh, restricting the LLMs into reliable and unreliable LLMs that for was reference. The, that was my whole point of this talk. That is extremely hard to do that. That in fact I mentioned... Uh, Unlearning becomes difficult is what you are no, saying. No, I'm just saying that can we make them behave is what you are saying. And it's very hard to make them behave. You can try but it's very hard to make them behave. Again, you know, I can shift in both ways. Can you make people behave? No. How are you running the society? If they don't behave, you will put them in Tihar jail. Or whatever is the best jail in Hyderabad, the worst jail in Hyderabad. Okay? There is, there is both st sticks and carrots <laughs> for behaving. How would you put an LLM in the jail if it doesn't behave? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, be making them behave, only the positive feedback works. And the positive feedback is this RLHF, which is very, very time consuming. And it's in some sense, all of us wasting our lives to make this AI system better. You know, which is very different than 600 gigabytes of text because we didn't write it for this thing. We just wrote it for ourselves and it just looked over our shoulder. Whereas this other stuff that we're doing, we're doing it only for them. You don't need to tell anybody, okay, any two essays, this I like, this I don't like. If there is anybody who actually doesn't think two Muslims going into a mosque and shooting people is offensive text, I want them to be out of the society. Maybe in Tihar jail. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't need to tell you this stuff. Whereas LLMs, you know, you do need to have even that sort of information has to be said in this course. Half gossip and half rumor, summarizingly, mm. as we see today. Well, you written rumor. Collective. And, and National Enquirer sometimes actually can tell the truth. National Enquirer being a tabloid, you know. Yes. And so, yeah. But again, I don't want you to take only the negative thing. To some extent, what I was trying to do is, for those of you who thought LLMs can do everything, I wanted to tell you there are obvious limitations, but at the same time, 
they are also very impressive technology uh, you could use them you know you can actually writers are already doing this they can give yes. like a sketch and say complete the paragraph and yes, they can make a, like a thing yeah so it's a human in the loop use of these technologies is completely fine in Wrong my right. right because there it would be the buck stops with you you are in charge of ensuring that what came out is you know your name good name is going to go down yeah it can be yeah, yeah this way or that way number one mm -hmm. number two you try to show that we can extrapolate based on the past events you say this is what is to happen mm -hmm. now i say what is there now can i go back and say this was the history which is okay wrong, so here is the very which is wrong history or right history say like here is a very india was free I no or yes i understand yeah here is a very interesting thing that i want you to realize you know this but i want you to realize if you are writing about future are about past are about present it is just a sequence of words in language there is no difference between past present and future it's always a sequence of words in english they go left to right in urdu they go right to left that's it okay language is an amazing abstraction humans have come up with it allowed us to think about future past present without having to actually be in 10 different places at the same time it's very much what makes us human and what's actually happening is because we are silly enough to put all our digital footprints on this web the llms basically these technologies as you know as even efficient as they are they are not at all like no I, I i hope you realize that human kids don't learn to speak language in fact even these guys haven't read anywhere near 600 gb of text human kids certainly don't and they learn slowly by being told by doing experiments by experiencing the world the com complete package together this thing just looks at what you have written and it's trying to predict the next word it was meant to be just a prediction of the next word really you know when you're writing on the cell phone sometimes it corrects your spelling or tells you the next word that's an llm the actual llms have always been part of your lives you didn't realize this google had bert system that's been completely integrated into google services they didn't put it out as a bigger system to do chatting because google actually is a serious company with a stock that can go down and so if in fact they put that thing and you know thus basically it said some anti-muslim or anti-female or anti-african-american things there would be a huge backlash and the stock would go down so sundar pichai said don't do this let's not do this we have something to lose it's not surprising that people who have something to lose tend to be a little more conservative open ai had nothing to lose open ai was a startup and so basically they said hey you know yeah, yeah i know all of you are thinking what we'll just put it out and see what happens and then we will use people to figure out whether or not it's working good and you know enough people find problems and then they'll try to try to fix it sort of thing so that's the thing so the fact that it's just completing and it's that even that completion at that mega scale winds up having these quote unquote emergent properties the word emergent means you didn't design for it but it is there and surprisingly enough any self-respecting engineer would hate emergent properties else no self-respecting engineer takes pride in the fact that the bridge on like the the over bridge that they built you know to the airport not only holds up in strong winds but on saturday sinks and on sundays flies that's like a failure as an engineer you should be slapped llms were not engineered there is no algorithm between behind llms it's just a learning algorithm given a humongous amount of language that you all wrote on the web that's it and so in fact the word algorithm itself is a wrong thing you know essentially it's just a simple learning technique that is using the language so your kid comes in you know same kid going up into different families might behave very differently because of what they hear their parents say
you are not surprised. Trying to bring a little bit of optimism into your <laughs> talk. I am not optimistic enough, you think? <laughs> because, <laughs> no, no, I am trying to think. I mean, uh, given that the predictions that uh, ChatGPT makes is mostly uh, hallucination, some of them may be aligned to you, what you think is the correct thing, or maybe the actual correct thing, or something that you like. Uh, and even as you speak, it's scanning all the six, uh, 600 GB data which mm -hmm. is already there. And even as, as you speak, more and more content is going into the 600 GB, mm -hmm. expanding ever. And it's likely that most of the content, I mean, I would not say most, but much of the content could be correct, right, li what you like, or in that direction, not in the other direction that you point. So if it, that being so, isn't it likely that going forward, the predictions that GPT will make will come closer to the truth okay. than moving away? That's Unless, of course, you assume that all the content which is put, being put is bad. That's, that's, what I'm saying. Okay. That's a that is not at all a source for any optimism. Some of you people, the younger guys know that Microsoft, much before this stuff, had made a tweet bot called Tay. And what Tay would do is, it was doing a very simple LLM, you know, a very primitive LLM. It would tweet and people can tweet at it, then it will tweet back and it will try to learn from these tweets. It wasn't looking at the entire world's model. So one day it started, it said, hello world, and you know, it had some background, oh, it said some nice things, etc., etc. And then people then started realizing that this can, this is suggestible. They started tweeting random stuff at it. By the next day, it started saying, Hitler is a beautiful man, and <laughs> things of that kind. It went from pure, pristine tweet bot day to the raging lunatic, anti-women, anti-Jewish, anti-everything. Who made this happen? People. World is adversarial. Don't ever, the worst mistake you can make is, I'm sure people will behave correctly, right? I mean, remember that when I was a kid, there was this story that the king says, uh, I put this uh, big uh, bucket outside and, you know, I want you to get milk and uh, I basically want to make sure that it's not, you know, I, I know that some of you will put water in it, but I want to make sure that there's a milk of at least this much concentration, otherwise I'll be mad. And by the end of the mo day, he looked and he had 100% water. Because everybody thought other people will put the milk, we'll put the water. Right? <laughs> right? And that's how the world works. So don't depend on the web becoming suddenly non-adversarial. So that's not at all a source of my optimism. We are our worst enemies. You know, we didn't need AI to help us get into all the problems we got into. Uh, it's almost like a machine which we kind of poke and learn how they behave, right? So, uh, to my knowledge, much of the way our mind works is also not completely figured out. So how much of, how much can we as a human race can learn about how we work? by actually learning about LLM. And physics, let's say, I don't understand astrology. That doesn't mean astrology and physics are one and the same. Or they look, work the same way. They, they just, I don't understand them. So it turns out in the case of human brain versus these things, there is almost no connection between how humans learn language and how these systems learn to complete language. Because as I said, none of you have used 600 GB of text. Okay, so, but on the other hand, this part is true, which is that there are no guarantees with humans either. And we try to prompt them to do the right things, and if they misbehave, at least we can put them in jail, etc., etc. The jail part is the only thing that is missing. It's not that humans actually have any, uh, you know, guarantees either. So at a top level, in fact, one of the reasons the very prompting becomes very interesting for people is because that's how they talk to each other. So you're now talking to the machine. Why do you talk to do dogs? We talk to dogs because we only know how to deal with people. We really don't know how to deal with dogs. Okay? And since we know how to deal with people and where you talk to them, and so in fact, you know, like, again, my sister would actually talk to the dog as if it's like a little kid, you know, and she will talk to the kid, the dog, as if you would talk to a little kid. Dog may not actually make any differentiation between the, no, we know that the human brain, human kid's brain is actually sensitive to high pitched voices and that's why the mother's, you know, cooing to the kids actually helps them. It's not at all clear that that's true for dogs. But we do it because that's all we know. We are the most self-centered species in the world. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, 
essentially, you know, the fact that LLMs will do, so coming back to your question, I mean, the fact that it basically is opaque and that we don't know how it works, all it says is, yes, you know, it, it, that's true and, you know, people are also opaque, but th that's about it. It doesn't mean that they are opaque for the same reasons. And on the other hand, people, we developed civilization to make sure that the opacity is reduced because language helps us explain our decisions in many cases. Again, as I said, you don't have judges saying, I feel like this guy should go to jail. And, you know, they actually have to write an explanation. And that needs to be vetted by other people, you know. So there are ways in which we handle that. I mean, you can say that LLM can also provide an explanation. In fact, one of the interesting things is when it makes a wrong decision, you can ask it to explain. It will give a fake explanation. My biggest worry is some of you have heard of GDPR, where they the, say that machine decisions should be accompanied with explanations, but they mean good, ex real explanations. You can always ask ChatGPT for a facile explanation, it will give it. And then you can put that to the people and they'll feel good and go. Right? I mean, I mean, many a time you know that. I mean, something is not ready when they said, when the shop person said it will be ready, you'll go and they'll give some kind of a kakamimi story. As long as they say it in nice enough voice, you believe it. The real explanations are hard to come by and ChatGPT can generate, if you don't care about real, ChatGPT can generate good sounding explanations. Okay? Hello, sir. Uh, thank you. This was very, very informative. Thank you for being here. So my question is, uh, because these language, uh, large language models, uh, like, you know, learn from what we tell to them. So on one hand, language is an example of, you know, spontaneous order. So because there is no fixed, like, you know, entity, the language continuously evolves. If you see social media, new words keep on coming and the way we use words also keep on changing. So unless we are continuously feeding data to these algorithms or to LLMs, so they can't update themselves, they can't be relevant. If we are feeding them back to them, the problem that can arise is that uh, they can feed on their own generation. So if LLM generates an answer and it is feeding upon itself, so how do you see this divergence? On one hand, we need it to read the web in the current mode. On the other hand, we don't want it to read the same stuff it is creating so that the hallucinations are perpetuated forever. So how do you see this as a way uh, like, actually, you know, going forward? So it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting longer question and I kind of touched on it in this talk. I mean, th these are my usual lectures. All the questions that come have been answered in the lecture. It's just that I have to re-explain because, you know, it matters what you get, not what I say. Um, so th the important point is, first of all, it is true that they basically learn language based on that language that's been presented to them. But I do want to correct to you that we never are teaching LLMs anything except for that stupid RLHF thing where we are using like Nigerians and Kenyans to kind of explain which you know, essay is better. Other stuff we wrote for ourselves. We didn't write it for LLMs. That's the beauty of it. That's why it's broad and shallow. It's actually applicable because it's just, it's everything that web is relevant for and web is relevant for everything. Okay, and, and we keep writing more stuff on the web that will become fodder to it. As far as the stuff that LLM generates becoming part of the web, that is something that I did talk about very specifically. Right now it's 600 GB. If you allow ChatGPT to put stuff up on the web pages and become part of the text, it will become like 3 trillion <laughs> GB in like, you know, a couple of seconds, a couple of days, right? And in fact, there's a very interesting question. The theoretical ramifications of that are not at all clear, but they are not, I should not use the word theoretical at all because they're not that much theory yet here. Um, but the following is true. One of the interesting things that people have found with LLMs is this idea called chain of thought prompting, which is the LLM, basically you ask LLM to ask itself, am I thinking right? Just ask it, ask it to ask itself every once in a while. And that seems to, by some benchmark study, seems to improve its accuracy, its form better. And people just love it because we do this. People love this thing because we do this. When we are thinking, we talk to ourselves. We come up with an idea, we say, I don't know, I think this may not work. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I have known people who are considered 
who are professors who are also considered mad people, maybe they're one and the same, because they talk to themselves, right? Because they come up with an idea, they're criticizing the idea themselves, they're coming up with the next idea, and they're prompting themselves. Everything is in your brain, but you are just asking it to think more. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? And LLMs can, and there are some reasons to believe that in some cases, LLMs can also do that sort of a thing. So while putting extra trillion gigabytes of LLM data might be bad, once in a while asking it to generate some text and make it part of its own prompt. Remember, every conversation is both what I said and what you said and what I said and what you said. So what it said is relevant, legitimate part of the conversation. And it can say things, and then that becomes part of, uh, that can improve its accuracy to some extent. There are, you know, this chain of thought prompting um, has been shown to be useful. Again, I'm not completely sure theoretically whether this will hold up, but people love it because people do it. You know, many of these things, you know, happen because we anthropomorphize the heck out of everything. We see like, you know, Venkateshwar Swami, Namams on every random, you know, stone, at least when I was a kid, they were all over the place. Okay. Um, and we see Mother Mary on burnt toast. And we see um, meaning in what LLM is saying and say it, it wanted to talk to me. Some of the most worrisome scenarios about LLM for me are the ones where you use LLMs for counseling. You may not remember, you may not know this, you may not remember this, but the history's first chatbot, have anybody, any of the younger guys know? What is the history's first chatbot? No, Eliza. Eliza was made by Joe Weizenbaum in 1960 or 58. It was a pattern-based conversation agent. It's not as good as this. It was trying to imitate a Rogerian psychoanalyst. And Rogerian psychoanalysts tend to basically repeat what you said to them. So if you say something, you'll say, then is it because if you say something about your father, you say you didn't like your father. And then you will then pour your heart out. Then they'll take one sentence of it, repeat it to you. You'll pour some more of the heart out. And supposedly Rogerian psychologists actually use this to figure out your uh, thing. Um, Joe Weizenbaum said, hey, this looks like an easy enough thing to automate. So he made a couple of patterns so that it will repeat, okay, th is this because you didn't like your mother? Is it because you hated your brother? That sort of a thing. And it was, this was 19, remember this is 1958, you know, there, <laughs> there was no cell phones, there was no even computers of any kind. And it was actually, and people were having conversations with it. And he stopped that project he stopped it because one day he found secretaries he in the office secretaries were pouring their hearts out to this program and he knew that this program is just pattern matching it has no empathy what we consider empathy in human terms it has no understanding what he considered human you know understanding in human terms so he stopped it now we are eliza power infinity <laughs> of some sort which is chat gpt it will basically have conversation with you, which actually makes quite a reasonable sense in many cases. Again, remember, counseling is there's no yes or no, this is correct counseling, this is not correct counseling. Wherever that sort of a thing is happening, plausible completions, ChatGPT can do very well. So, but do I really want ChatGPT to counsel patients? Do I want ChatGPT to call my mother? Because we more or less talk about the same things when I call my mother. Typically, she asks me, what is the time in US? I've only been there for 40 years, so you know, I think it can still change. But you know, that's one of the questions she asks. Do you understand what I'm saying? But should I? Yeah, that's true. So come on. I mean, I can have ChatGPT talk to my mother. But then that's me deciding that I don't want to be human. And if you don't want to be human, I can't help you. But don't yell at AI, don't yell at ChatGPT. You want to give up your humanity, that's up to you. You know, you want to call ChatGPT to call your mother, you want uh, ChatGPT to write your love letters and wedding vows, you know, so that what the heck will you do with that extra time that is freed up? I have no idea, but you know, that's up to you. But, you know, those are things that are ethically very, very questionable uses some of which would be stopped, as I said, 
people who write their wedding vows or love letters with chat gpt won't have relations very quickly because nobody likes that but some other thing society might say okay it's reasonable to have counseling with these machines and it's already there are companies which provide counseling support this way and they will make an argument saying look counseling is costly not everybody is getting any counseling when there is not getting any counseling why not have chat gpt counseling do, do you understand what i'm saying what yeah that you can write yeah i understand but i'm less worried about that i mean in fact i think you know hallmark already you know that people no longer give i don't know i think in india they still do but in general if you give me a greeting card with printed text that hallmark wrote i throw it away i'll kind of you know yeah yeah thank you and throw it away you write something yourself at least in the past i could believe that you wrote it now i will have to present it to this chat gpt checker to see whether you actually made chat gpt say something and you wrote it in your fake handwriting but once i do and once i find that it's not written by you i lose my trust in you and that is the end of the world yeah now we are uh, creating a ai news readers uh, uh, chat gpt can give us the text and on the fly you can choose the characteristics of the news reader so now when i ask for a, mm, a kid with the features of aishwarya rai and jayalalitha mm -hmm. i am get an excellent image mm -hmm. now when it is converted as a uh, as an image it's okay but when that image starts speaking as a ai news reader is it subject you to infringement anybody can come to us and how is the ai lost no no the first of all this is actually a different question i'll answer now that you are hinting at which is where is the copyright issues i had a slide on it i just didn't you know go into that um in the far back but um i don't know why it went away but oh it will go away. so um so there is this basically who owns the copyright for things and one of the there are like two interesting questions one is google presents the actual file that wall street journal or new york times has in their servers and say you read them and in the beginning when google did it these guys will say yeah hey, you are sending our files to other people we didn't allow you to do it but then they realize this they can't fight it this is what i'm saying and so in some sense at least they get some actual traffic and they can monetize it etc you know journalism is mostly dead because of this whole digital revolution but at least they have some sense of copyright now what is happening is that actually you can never prove that something is fully copied because it's not copying it's not indexing anything in fact one of the reasons people like gpt chat gpt is because it says stuff that's not directly from a file it looks as if it is just talking like us you know i'm as putting my words i'm putting one word after other it's not in any file but i'm saying it and so you feel good that this is a live speaker blah 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 right so but on the other hand that also means that it's harder to prove copyright infringement do you understand what i'm saying and that's a very interesting question so when stable diffusion actually was trained on more of the more of the fine art pieces compared to dali and they actually used the you know fine art pieces that artists have put for other prospective buyers to look at but it's on the web so they just scraped all of that and trained stable diffusion that way and so it generates like as i showed you already dali did this jamini rai style if jamini rai was alive he might say that he might cry foul saying you know i was going to do my jamini rai woman with a computer and now this bozo just sends this thing and he's going to get this twitter likes instead of me getting cups of rupees right that becomes an issue for you know art uh, thing and it's completely an open question right now in fact the artists have sued um uh, the stable diffusion and mid journey makers saying you violated our copyright just by essentially training your machine on our data the interesting thing is remember when you go into shops you know you go into a fine art shop right typically they don't stop you from looking at the pieces you might look at the pieces if you are a good painter you might learn something about the style and that's not considered illegal use but when you go into all the 
possible fine art shops of the world, which is what ChatGP, well, stable diffusion does, then it becomes a much harder question. Do, do you see what I'm saying? And you notice that even in fine art shops, typically good fine art shops won't allow you to take cell phone photographs of the paintings. Even though they might put it, they don't like it because they just don't want to make copying too easy and style co copying too easy. And all of these are big questions and these guys are fighting, but on the other hand, history has been on the side of technological direction. Like even Napster basically said, no vinyl and we'll just be able to get free music. And from free music, we pay cents for 18,000 you know, listens of a particular song which is much less than the money they used to get before, but they're thinking at least it's better than zero. So you reduce their expectations and then give them a couple of things. That can happen.